So the question is whether we would use an RPP in a six to eight week old who has respiratory symptoms and a fever. You, you, you guys have heard um, um, my take on RPPs in the past and I still feel the same. Um, I think RPP is a crutch, personally. I think RPP, um, so we're talking about um, uh, respiratory pathogen panel. So we're looking for a bug. If you have a child who has a runny nose and a cough that started two days ago, I know the kid has a bug. I know it, and so do you. So why do we have to have a name for that bug? They're, they're, uh, kids don't get runny nose and cough for no reason at all. They get it because they have a viral infection. If you have a child that's being admitted, or if you have a child that might be, uh, well, is being admitted, you're trying to decide whether you want to uh, put them on antibiotics or not, Doing an RPP might be of some benefit, and especially for cohorting. In some hospitals, that's still necessary. But for an outpatient, I, I think it's silliness, because frankly, what happens if you get a negative? Are you then gonna say, well, that runny nose and cough is meaningless, I don't have any source at all, therefore I have to do a spinal tap. I think that would be a fallacy. You know the kid has a viral infection. Whether you can name it or not doesn't make any difference to me. Kind of, kind of similar to how I do it in adults. If, if you're going to an ICU setting, sure, I'll, I'll order just about any test you want. You've already decided that you're going to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on that patient. But for the most part, I find it gets misused, like Jim points out. It, it doesn't help to know that they have a coronavirus until someone figures out a, a coronavirus-specific therapy. And kids carry so many viruses that statistically it's dishonest to say, oh, look, they've got RSV, therefore they can't have meningitis. I, I challenge anyone to show me how RSV is protective of meningitis. Yeah, and that brings up an important point. There was a great study that was done in the, it was either the 70s or the 80s, um, it, it, looking into why kids get sepsis or meningitis. Think about it for a second, guys. What are the bugs that are causing this? So group B strep in the very young. Um, in the older kids, it's strep pneumo, it's H flu B, and it's meninge. What, what similarity do all these bugs have? they're all carried in the nasopharynx. So it's bugs that are carried in the nasopharynx that are causing these invasive infections. Why? So this question was asked by a researcher, I think it was Moxon, Richard Moxon back in the 70s or 80s. What he did was he took a bunch of rabbits and <clears throat> 50 of the rabbits he gave a cold to. He, gave, he injected them with rhinovirus and caused respiratory symptoms in those rabbits. Another 50 rabbits he left alone. After those first 50 rabbits got rip-roaring cold symptoms, he then injected both groups of rabbits with H flu B. What he got was a much higher invasive rate, invasive infection rate, in the group that had the preceding respiratory infection. What that probably tells us is that what's going on here, and the reason we have respiratory pathogens as the primary cause of sepsis and meningitis in little, in little small children, is that there are, there is a, a protective barrier there that is breached when kids get URIs. So if you have a child who has a URI, and particularly if they get prolonged fever or a fever that starts up maybe a week later, what you should be thinking about is, has something happened here? Has the, has the protective barrier been breached and now allowed the bacteria to get in? And that's why, even if they do have respiratory symptoms, it's important to think, yeah, but there still could be some bacterial infection on top of this. And that's especially why, especially in the case of a, of a kid who looks toxic, by all means, go full court press on those kids.